Okay, so right now we're looking at the gold uh, USD monthly chart. A lot of people have kind of, you know, been wondering about gold. Is gold in a, you know, a macro breakout? Is it, is it bullish? Is it, is it bearish? Do I buy gold? Do I sell gold? Um, so I guess, you know, if you're, if you're trying to ask that question, you, you want to take a little bit of a top-down approach and start, you know, from, from the top, essentially start from the, uh, well, you'd want to start from the quarterly, um, but it's a little bit easier to see the distinctions if you go down to a monthly chart. So I kind of marked off, you know, these different levels here. You can see that, you know, gold does play out pretty damn technically on the chart. And I think that's probably a function of the liquidity. I mean, you know, whatever you think about the gold market, you know, whether you like it, you don't, you think it has a promising future, it doesn't. It has a pretty big market cap and has a lot of liquidity, so it's going to move pretty technically. And uh, you can see that here, right? It kind of moves up until it, uh, well, essentially, you know, it. you get this parabolic run up following the, uh, well, really the OA crash. And then you get your quantitative easing. Of course, that puts, you know, puts the gas behind gold and it moves up into what, you know, you could consider a blow off top. And then, but then these levels are kind of historically relevant. You see it, you know, blows off, comes back to this level, rallies off, breaks that level, comes down to this level, uh, hits that, rallies up, then ends up closing below, tests up again, comes down, hits this level down here roughly. It's not perfect, but roughly this level here, runs up, rallies up to there. And then you kind of get, you know, a little bit of a sustained downtrend on, on the macro time frame, And then you get, a uh, little bit of change of behavior here, right? Start, you know, kind of macro kind of reverses around and, uh, you know, maybe this is a 618 retracement if you draw this here. Uh, it's getting stuck, but yeah, you get the idea. It takes out these highs right here, comes up, retraces, and then you get, you know, a market structure shift on the uh, on the macro time frame, And that, and that kind of continues, right? So it, after that, break of the high and the retracement into the 618, uh, the lows hold on the macro since, since that, uh, January 17th. And, uh, really ever since we haven't, uh, haven't had any lows, uh, violated came pretty close right here. Uh, maybe it did. Let's see this, the low on this monthly candle is one, six, seven, seven. And this one is one six seven six. So yeah, so never, never violated. So, uh, and, but, you know, even if it did violate, you know, a couple dollars and then, and then had this type of bullish wick, you wouldn't really interpret that as a violation, right? It'd be more of a stop run, but, but still, even then it didn't, you know, the lows have been defended on the macro and, uh, that that's pretty clear to see. So then, you know, we, we identified that shift kind of right here in, uh, well, October 15th. So then if I go down, switch time frames down to, uh, you know, like uh, a weekly mm -hmm. chart, then I would probably want to use that areas like the left hand side of the side of my screen to kind of demark the, the area I'm looking at. And still, we're still looking at like five years price action. And you can see here, and this is a really good example because remember how we noted on the lows that are on the monthly chart that that the lows never got violated after this point in uh, since 2015 on the monthly, but you know they they do get violated on the weekly. So this is a situation we kind of had this discussion before in the Discord, you know, arguing about uh, weekly lower lows. Well, you know, here's a good example of where you know you have a, a lower low on the weekly, but the monthly never violated the monthly low. So you know. So yeah, you have a, a lower a downtrend, a small downtrends on the weekly, but then something something was happening on the macro, right? They kind of picked it up, and and the larger term picture kind of took over, and even on a weekly, uh, which kind of shows you that there's you know a little bit of fundamental things going on in in this market. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, so you can see, you know, again, it plays out pretty technically, right? You have your uh, well, where we're anchored to this price chart here, you know, you get a level like this, comes down, tests it, 
runs up, get your typical price swing. That's where we identify the 618. Then starts moving, moves pretty technically. This is probably all, also a 618 relative to this low here. Moves up, test this area, retrace a little bit. Then you start to get your, your impulsive move up. Starts getting parabolic, right? You can see that, you know, specifically here, and then you get your blow off top. And uh, something, you know, kind of a little bit of a weekly downtrend kind of going on until this rally here, right? And then we would probably need to go to a daily time frame to kind of see that better. But yeah, again, you can kind of see here, right? This. So yeah, so on on the uh, on this downtrend here, right? It it did take out some of the highs, right? But if you go to go to a weekly time frame, right? These highs you wouldn't be able to identify them on the highs uh, on the weekly time frame. So. You, you know, this high never took out this high, which is probably your, your significant, significantly relevant high. Um, <clears throat> but then you see like price, you know, volatility kind of coils up, expands. And then you see kind of, so it never really, it doesn't take out this high, right? It still kind of runs up to it, doesn't make it above it, sells off. But, you know, it does kind of, it, it is starting to change behavior, at least on the low time frames. And, uh, you know, comes down here, defends these lows, never violates these lows. And you can kind of see kind of volatility contracts and then picks up again. Uh, so that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, yeah, again, it, it's, it's, uh, there's really no technical reason to get bullish. Uh, I'm sorry, bearish on, on gold. I mean, there are other reasons you could, uh, formulate a bearish bias, but, uh, just, you, I don't know how you could look at the chart and, uh, you know, I, ju I just don't see it in the chart. Now, gold is one of those things where, you know, it, it's one of those where it's kind of, it's hard for me to kind of formulate a bias on it, like as an asset, just because, you know, it has some serious, uh, serious issues and, but it also has a lot of stuff going for it. Um, so that's, it's one of those things that could go either way. Um, and if you have an asset like that, it probably makes a good hedge, right? Just because you don't, it's really difficult to know exactly what, you know, which direction it will go or, or what its future holds. Um, I don't know, you guys were, you guys were kind of talking about Russia and gold and sort of the, uh, macro implications of that. Um, I mean, uh, yeah, I think it's, I, I, I posted that video in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it's kind of unlikely that, that we ever return to a gold standard just because that means that, you know, governments have to spend within their means. You know, if, if, if you're, yeah. if your currency is exchangeable for gold, then that means you, you can't you know, you, you have to spend within your means. You can't debase your currency by printing more because then people will just use your that is, debased currency to take all your gold. That is absolutely true. But, you know, on that topic, I would like to put out some sort of a, a provoking question, if you wish. Like, you were saying no less than it was last week, I guess, but even yesterday now we were having a chat. Like, these, some sort of a doubt where, you know, major central central banks are actually accumulating bitcoin right <laughs> so wouldn't wouldn't it be the same it, it would still be you know having a, a fiat currency which is backed by something which is no gold anymore but it's bitcoin and you know if you run by the assumption that bitcoin is like gold just better that would present the same problem for them they couldn't they couldn't inflate the currency because they would need to to stick to what the reserve actually allow them to to print, right? The thing, the thing is, from what the research I've done, gold standards has not been used much through the entire history. It was used to thirty years after after World War Two, but it wasn't used prior to World War Two. And I think the last time they tried to use it, it gets used for like about twenty or thirty years at a time, and then they realise it doesn't really work, so they stop using it. That's 
I may have got that completely wrong. But that's the that's what I've noticed in research. So well, okay, people go, so oh, you guys, gold standard. Is it, you guys are talking it, as about if it's like yeah, it was in that way, but it, it hasn't. You guys are talking about two separate and concepts at the same time. So on one hand, gold has been right. used in in to facilitate trade for uh, you know thousands of years, right? Before the Bible was written. Yes. Um, yeah, yeah. Now. Uh, as a gold standard, that's not the same as gold being used in trade. What that means is that uh, uh, okay. company or not companies, countries have uh, tied their currency to gold, and so that means that you can go to the the central bank and exchange your notes for actual gold. So they're two different. I things. was talking about that actually, just yeah. referring to Bitcoin. Yeah. So, so I don't think they're ever. I mean, so you got it's an important distinction because. Yeah, they may be accumulating Bitcoin like they accumulated gold, but they're ne they're never going to let you exchange their fiat currency for Bitcoin or gold. You know. So, you know, the problem is just postponed because we are going to have a situation where someone and you know, it, it is just a speculation of course, right? We we are just running off speculations, but let's say even if you basically swap uh, the role of gold in the central banking system with Bitcoin, you're going to end up with the same result. They are going to print more than what the Bitcoin they hold, you know, potentially we would allow them to. So what, what would change? Well, I think the important thing to m mention is like they're, n they're not on a standard, right? I mean, they are going to print more than the, you're using the type of uh, framework to describe it as if like the dollar was exchangeable for Bitcoin. Right to like directly, like like you could go to the central bank and and exchange it, but yeah, that's that's never going to happen, right? Because what that would mean essentially is that they can't they can't inflate their currency, they they can't spend what they want to spend, right? And essentially, so go, okay, so yeah. we are we are sticking on the point that they will keep on being fraudulent even after the swap, if you wish, right? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. I, I mean, it's a weird, it's at that point, you kind of enter the twilight zone, right? So it's, it's not clear yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly what happens there, but I would imagine, I would imagine actually, what would you use the word? sorry, what's up? Why would you use the word forger referring to a government? Uh, fraudulent, like they are doing it with, you know, the purpose of doing it. They are doing it because they know what you're doing, which is essentially uh, robbing people. Uh, with, from, from with, you know, they are taking away your wealth essentially by inflating away the currency. Yeah, yeah I wouldn't call that fraudulent, but uh, I, I know I, I, I get exactly what you mean. I just wanted to clarify some language there. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's may okay. So maybe it's my bad. Some sort of a language barrier there, but you know, theft. You, yeah. you can call it whatever, right? No, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. But I think I think it's kind of an interesting exercise because that is, I, I believe, the most likely scenario, right? If you just, you know, think logically, what is the most likely scenario? Then they're probably they're probably buying Bitcoin and accumulating reserves, and but that doesn't mean that they're gonna, you know. There's, they still want to utilize a fiat currency on, on top of that, right? So that they can use that as a way to, you know, get out of their, their liabilities. And so, well, they're, they're developing the CBDC thing at the same time, aren't they? So there'll be a shift, um, won't they? Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah, like, it would, this whole different. It would be better. I mean, well, it that, is, so is Bitcoin. So, yeah. I mean, everything, but not CBDC, please. Yeah, I mean, CBDC is the question for a government. If you think about it, they don't have any choice really because the dollar is failing. Quite clearly. Well, I think so. I think well, that I important... was talking from the perspective of a, a citizen, not not the government. You know. Oh, I so see. I think Sorry. an important thing to talk about is that there's a lot of different roads you can go down, a lot of different rabbit holes. But essentially, if you play out that scenario where you know big players like the central bank start accumulating Bitcoin like they have with gold, then I think an important thing to, uh, you know, mention is that 
they're not, it doesn't matter how much they accumulate, they're not able to control it the way they are able to control like, other currencies. Right. It, and that's really important because we kind of, kind of have an implicit assumption that, that they're able to do that, but it does, that's not how Bitcoin works. Like it doesn't matter how much you accumulate, how much you have, you can't, you can't control the network. Yeah. So, I mean, to that point, the Fed is not even able to control the U.S. dollar. So, you know, <laughs> that that is a problem that they they basically have never fixed, you know. Yeah. Well, this is the nature of, uh, this is the nature of something that re represents enough psychology, though, any, anyway. You, you, once you let it out into the wild, you, you, you have to obey its rules. You can't just control it and control it. You can, you can guide it the way you, you're going to, to your advantage, but you can never really truly control it. I mean, this is what's happened with Bitcoin. You thought it would be controllable, but as soon as you let that into the wild, uh, it does its own thing and it gets its own value from the people using it. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, if they really start to collect or to accumulate or even to confiscate the majority of the Bitcoins out there, they would, they would be essentially obtain the effect that the little part which is still in circulation will, would go up in value. Yeah. And even, you know, and given the point that it is so fractionable in Satoshi, you could just start, you know, uh, sell all your trades in Satoshi instead of a single Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, this is a thing though, that, that what, what they can do is they can dump on the market to make it crash. And stuff. They can do things like that. I mean, we, we see, we've seen that happen, before. well, We've seen that be blamed before, like the Mount Gox thing. That was uh, that, yeah. that was blamed for the um, the crash of 2018. Was blamed on um, the, the guy holding the Mount Gox um, uh, bitcoins, wasn't it? Whether that's what happened, I'm not sure. But it's quite difficult to know what causes what really at that level, doesn't it? Well, I mean, it was blamed. It was blamed on that, but I, I don't think it was really that because if you look at history back Absolutely. right now, you you know that basically those those Bitcoin that was confiscated by the authorities, you know, they are still old, holded by uh, some sort of an institution, and there there was speculations and rumors about an auction to actually sell those Bitcoin. So they never they never came back in circulation. Oh, did they not? I, I don't think so, honestly. Oh, I I, I, I'm a well, I'm a bit, I'm a bit off that. the news. I'm a bit off the news recently, but you know, last time I checked, there was rumors about you know the infamous Bitcoin confiscating the Mon Monty Gox uh, act, and they were talking about you know uh, selling them out at, at an auction. So. Oh, wow. How can you how can you sell something which is out there in circulation and, and you don't own it? So of course it's, like, it's like over the desk trading, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. honestly, I, I don't think that the big crash of 2017-18 was due solely to the Monty Gox oh, act. No. I, I think it was just the time. The market cycle relative to Bitcoin was mature, and it, it was it was just yeah. too parabolic to keep going. Yeah, it was the hardening for sure. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, and even that. Yeah, the, the and you hardening. also had uh, you also had the block wars during that time. Oh, uh, that was oh, that, right. Yeah. Well, that was right. that was a couple of months earlier, wasn't that? Was October, wasn't it? Um, yeah, yeah. The yeah. whole show between uh, yeah, there was block, a block box and so forth. It was supposed to be a, a fork or something like that. Yeah, there was a lot of fud around at that time, probably because it was an, it was the first time it was a big all time high that everyone was really pouncing yeah. on it. Because I've, I've been in Bitcoin for about 10 years and I, there'd never been so much fuss as there was in 2017. Because in 2000, was it 14 when the last one was? I didn't see it all over the news and stuff like that. I'd see the odd, the odd bit here and there, but it wasn't like, not like it was in 2017, where it was just all over the place and maybe everyone was jumping on the bandwagon at that point, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, it was insane. Yeah, it was insane. Uh, yeah, well, I think a, a lot of that is also down to the fact that it suddenly became available to the general public. Because if you think about it, Mount Gox was the very first exchange which obviously failed. Prior to that, you'd have to go out and get it off somebody in the street or get it off somebody from a forum. Do you know what I mean? And you had to pay them directly because there wasn't exchanges. I think that played um, a big part in that in that whole parabolic rise. Yeah. Time. 
And if you want to add a little bit more, back then there was the BitConnect uh, debacle, right? Oh, that was hilarious, yeah. So, I mean,